Hi, everyone. How's it going? You sure? You, you guys look like you didn't eat very well over lunchtime. So I hope this session will not bore you, so we'll try and keep it interesting. Okay, so as mentioned, we've got a good mix of our panel members today. Uh, Aman, he is more on the strategic side, and our fellow startups providing solutions within the IoT space. So to start off with, um, let's, have, uh, let's have them share a little bit of background uh, about them and their business. So what does IoT mean to you and your business? So Syed, would you like to share? Please. <laughs> Hello. Um, I am uh, Syed of Katsana. Kat mana Katsana? <laughs> so, um, we are involved with telematics. Are you familiar with telematics? No idea. So it, it essentially tracks vehicles and we collect data from the vehicles transmitted to the server and to be analyzed. We started off with just a simple idea of tracking stolen cars. That was back in 2013. And by 2014, we started to have um, bigger enterprises coming on board from Hertz, Sandabi, Puncak Naga, and so on. And that's where we, we developed features to understand uh, driver profiles, uh, driver behavior patterns, and uh, we score drivers based on their risk uh, on the road. It nev I never thought of um, going deeply into this. But just, after a brief, one, just a brief yeah. one would do. Yeah. Mm. So, um, after a while, we, we, uh, we realized that we are essentially riding on IoT. Uh, what we are doing, it's essentially uh, what IoT is also all about, uh, getting cars connected to the internet. And right now, we are growing much further than that. We are working directly with a few car manufacturers to get our hardware equipped onto the cars. Okay, yeah. good enough. So next, um, Faisal, would you like to share what does IoT mean to you and your business? Does this work? Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Faisal. My startup is called Border Pass. What we are doing is we are doing online passports, which digitizes the passport chip and also your biometric information. We send it to the government uh, immigration authorities the moment you book your flight. Uh, so that they can start the immigration process even before you've uh, arrived in the country. So that when you do arrive at the airport, uh, you just go through one of our automated gates. So that's a very that's short description. Cool. Dr. Young. Hello, my name is Young. I'm a senior lecturer at UTM, co-founded Fire Startup Company. And one of them is the F Automation. We basically build robotics for industry. In the past, it's just like far uh, far <laughs> it just happened that actually we didn't plan for IoT. In the past, our robot can only use for regional. But once we have the IoT enabled, our robot actually now exported to Philippines, Vietnam, Mexico, and a couple of countries. So, uh, so that's what we are doing for DF Automation. Hello, everybody. Uh, good to be here talking to all of you. So when I, I come from a very different perspective than all three uh, here on my right and Diana on the left. But my experience has been more on the strategy side of things. Uh, currently, I'm invested in uh, IoT companies, one of which is in the home automation space. Uh, another one is uh, we are working towards a solid state battery. So, and that has huge applications in the IoT sphere. And of course, for every IoT component to work, there's got to be a communications channel uh, associated with the devices. So. There's another company that I'm on the board for, which is in the communication space. So happy to talk about all three or wherever this conversation goes. Thank you. So um, based on what you have shared with us today uh, early, earlier, so um, in, in an example of rolling out an IoT implementation, has it been challenging for you? And if yes, how did you overcome those challenges? Who would you like to start first? Okay, Dr. Young, please. 
So DF is started back in 2012. We built robot for industry, uh, particularly automated guided vehicle. It's actually a mobile robot that can reach out from one place to another. So the whole idea is a big company, MNC, that doesn't want to hire operator do a very uh, tedious job. So they build a robot. So we build a robot, then it's moved, but then we want to monitor. So we try to put in IoT element here. We want to visualize stuff. We want to remote uh, control or remote stuff. And then when we ask a company actually try to put the internet that actually they say no. It's all security. They have no idea what's IoT. That is like four years back. But to our surprise, actually just I would say these two years, they are coming to us say that young, I want IoT. But actually they don't really know what is IoT. I mean, it just became that right now it's a buzzword everywhere. All the smart manufacturing are talking about IoT, IoT. Uh, but of course, the benefit side is tremendous. There's a lot of things can be done from visualization, from big data, all the way into uh, prediction, and of course, new knowledge. But at this moment, I think all the IoT, in my opinion, is very, very infancy stage. Visualization, maybe a little bit of a preventive. Um, but there's a lot of things coming up. I think big companies are looking forward for that kind of thing, so opportunities come a long way. So that is a challenge we had early days, but now things change uh, slowly and slowly. Faisal and Sai, would you like to share? Uh, sure. I mean, for us, there have been three challenges. The first one is getting approvals to do what we want to do at the airport. You can't just put anything into an airport, apparently. I didn't know this before. Uh, you apparently, you need to get some letters and things like that. So that took quite a bit of time. Um, and then you got to think about the Immigration Act of 1959 <laughs> and uh, see how you can fit what you're doing into that um, law, which was drafted at a time before IoT uh, you know, uh, even existed, uh, even with the amendments taken into account. Uh, the second is, of course, looking for funds to do something like this. Uh, we're not building an app um, that you know, will require a lot less capital. Uh, we are dealing with hardware, um, and that draws into the third challenge, which is looking for talent. Unfortunately, uh, young people these days uh, don't want to work with hardware anymore. Everybody wants to build the next great app. So uh, it's a bit hard to find talent. Uh, even if you find people who can do it, they sort of begrudgingly do it, uh, not because they really love hardware. So if you love hardware, please come up to me after this. Yeah. Well, uh, IoT, Internet of Things that things, it's the main problem, challenges for us right now. It's always, when it comes to things, when it comes to hardware, there's a lot of scalability issues with it. How many hardware startups that you know is successful out there? Pebble, Bunk, um, I know that Juicero, <laughs> another <laughs> failed startup. So there's always that scalab scalability uh, problem. We first encountered this when we start to deploy to our fleet customers. In fact, if the fleet has 2,000 vehicles to deploy, it's going to take us six months. It's not scalable at all. So after a while, we started to realize that in order for a hardware startup to scale, you have to partner, to, to partner with the established players. So what we do is that we identify all those players and the best players that going to benefit us tremendously and for them to, to, to be mutually beneficial for both of us is going to be car manufacturers and insurers. So right now we already have two car manufacturers working with us and we recently signed a um, uh, MOU with Allianz Malaysia, Etika Insurance and Etika Takaful. So for us it's imperative for hardware startup to identify who's going to be your biggest channel to the market. If you are going to do things on your own, you're going to kaput fast. I mean, it's called hardware for a reason. It's hard, you know. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, so now I'd like to ask Aman, what do you think about the opportunities available to the startups today and what's the current challenges? So I think Sayed brings up a very good point in terms of uh, the hardware part, the things, right? So there's a reason that most of the hardware companies fail. Uh, and the reason, in my opinion, is very clear. They don't really solve a problem. 
they, a lot of, lot of hardware companies go out chasing products that are nice to have, but they don't really go after the hard problems and identify early on what is the need for this product. And that, that's a big difference. If you're solving a need, the customer say, stays with you forever. And all of your new iterations and all of your new uh, features that come into your product, there's a huge opportunity to upsell to your customers. But the chasm that a lot of startup companies fail to overcome is not really identifying their, who, is, who is their early adopter and who's the customer that, that they can sell to. And the second part of that whole thing is not having the right channel to go to. A lot of companies fail because they identify, oh, let's just go to the consumer. But getting mind share from the consumer is so hard these days because there's, you know, 1,500 IoT devices on the market. For whatever application you can think of, somebody's already created a thing out there. So how do you get mindshare in such a noisy environment? That's, that's hard. So thinking through these two things, I think there's a lot of opportunity because nothing has been connected. If you think about it, there will be one trillion devices connected in the next 20 years. We are right now somewhere close to about eight to 10 billion. So there's a huge opportunity. And the way to think about where that opportunity lies is what is the need you're solving and how, do you're, how are you getting your product across the channel? Thank you, Aman. So when you talk about opportunities, the current opportunities that we have today, and do you think this opportunity you know, market size will grow larger in the future in the IoT space? Well, the market is very nascent right now, right? It's, uh, as, as I just said, we are, over the next 20 years, we are looking at connecting a trillion devices, and they will be in every sphere imaginable. You talk about home automation, you talk about healthcare, you talk about autonomous cars, robotics, you name a place, and nothing will be left untouched by Internet of Things, right? Even the Bitcoin miners, they are connected to the Internet, so you can call the cryptocurrency as play in the IoT space. So the, the, the market is obviously going to grow much, much bigger. It's about how do you create and extract value out of that market that's meaningful to your business. Great, thank you. Syed, you mentioned just now um, that you're working with insurance and fleet management. So what's, what's the next big thing for you in preparing solutions to meet the future demands? Well, as... as as I mentioned before, we never thought of going deeply into IoT space, but um, there's one component that comes with IoT, which is data. And from early on, we noticed that the data that we collect, right now we are collecting around 2 million kilometers of da travel data in Malaysia daily. We have almost uh, 700 million kilometers of data in Malaysia. Um, the data that we use, that we collected from these IoT devices, it's really beneficial in such a way that for insurers, it allows insurers to understand the patterns of drivers. It allows we, uh, it allows consumers as um, uh, vehicle owners to have fairer way of doing, uh, of getting insurance. Because currently what happened is that um, a small pool of drivers is causing the rest of other uh, drivers paying a higher insurance. Simply because this small pool are the bad drivers that is causing insurance to lose money a lot. So we identified these are the problems that we are going to solve. We are going to create safer roads in Malaysia. And how we do that is that by using our data that we collect from IT devices and use that data to help insurers and drivers to see that they can improve. In Malaysia, we are we are number 16 in the world when it comes to cut, when it comes to fatalities on the road. We are number six in the world when it comes to theft, car theft. We are so good at killing each other. Um, this is a problem that after a while we realize our bigger mission is to create safer roads through our technology. So IoT is the one that can enable it. Okay, thank you. Faisal, what about yourself? Um, how do you go about in preparing solutions to meet the future de demands? You've got your Border Pass 2.0 right now. What's next for you? Or what's next for Border Pass? 
Uh, right, we need to get more gates in basically. Um, if you take a look at the passenger numbers, uh, globally, uh, well, let's look at within ASEAN, six out of 16 of our airports are already at over capacity. So that causes all kinds of different problems. Uh, within Asia Pacific, we'll be seeing a tripling of passenger numbers in the next 20 years. And globally right now, we have 3 billion passengers traveling annually. And that's going to go to 7 billion in 2034. The current world population is 7 billion. Can you imagine stuffing everyone into a plane and just sending them somewhere around the world in just a space of one year? So, um, you know, if you take a look at the world, all the things that technology has changed, uh, one of the areas that it hasn't touched significantly is international travel and the credentialing process. It's still very much Casablanca, you know, sort of era, uh, papers and stamps and uh, officers going through things manually. Yeah. So uh, we see that as an opportunity to uh, change things. And, um, you know, I think Aman mentioned the impact of what we do. I mean, that's going to be our so-called KPI, right? Um, we want to make sure that you get through airport immigration in seconds. Nice. And Dr. Yong, um, what about for you? When we first started uh, the air automation, we thought that we'd just build robot for one particular reason. And along the way, is, uh, people come say, hey, Yong, can you communicate my robot with another robot? with another German company robot and so on, and, and it took time. We were at the Maida Open Day the other day, so there are four big companies there. So Zalfa DF Automation, then we have KUKA, uh, sorry, we have ABP, and we have uh, uh, Universal Robot. So three robots are speak at the different languages. And that is one of the bigger challenges that we have. Even right now, I think for the next two years, we still have uh, challenges in the standard communication, and all the big players are trying to come out with a standard uh, communication protocol between these all machines. When this is happening, a lot of things can be happening. Just like when I speak now, a lot of people can understand. And, and right now, if you go to the management plan, if there's uh, one vendor coming in, they just use only one or two vendors. They can't really just connect to everyone. But when this thing can be communicated to each other, a lot of things can be done. Things can move faster. For example, uh, I just spoke to uh, Faisal early on, or Sai early on. When you drive your car, actually, let's say your car is broken, one small little component. Your car with IoT is going to tell into the car manufacturer. And the car manufacturer is going to tell to the vendor, prepare all these small little components, and go to the manufacturer, and all the robots are going to start making the part before even we actually order the part. Okay, good. Um, so, since you're into automation and robotics, there's a lot of buzzword on industry revolution 4.0. So this may not be applicable to all the IoT players, but I believe that this is something that um, something that you can leverage on on this opportunity. Would you like to share your thoughts on this? Uh, in the past, like hardware, is very difficult. It's a robot company. It's a hardware company. To be frank, nobody interests about this hardware company robotic for the last five years. But moving forward, a lot of this robotic company getting traction, and I think. Two years back, KUKA sold to Maida for $5 billion. Universal Robot sold to Teradyne close to $300 uh, million. And it seems that actually hardware uh, robotics is actually get more interest compared in the past. The main reason is because Industry 4.0. Mm. And they see that everything can be automated. And if you go to one big manufacturing plant, you can see sometimes a thousand. Uh, I went to Vietnam, there are about 10,000 people. But imagine all these 10,000 people are actually replaced very dangerous word, <laughs> replaced by robot and uh, machine. And it can improve the quality of the product. At the same time, also uh, come up with the product that you want. Right now, we do manufacturing, for example, 1,000 cars with red color. But right now, actually, if we the IoT in place, robotic in place, you can actually customize into a very detail. The color that you want, the wheel that size that you want, even the, the dashboard, the car ladder, and so on, all can be customized into that kind of an extent. So the future is there, uh, but we're still a bit far from there and looking forward for a new startup. <laughs> so who's looking for a job? <laughs> um, Aman, so how much do you know about this industrial revolution 4.0? You did mention to me that in, in the States, 
um, is not a commonly term used. So how much do you know about it? Well, it's not a commonly uh, thrown about term as much, but I think the essence of what you're calling the Industrial Revolution for is already starting to pick up, right? I see that a lot with the autonomous vehicles space, uh, where, where now you're starting to get so much of, uh, uh, so much of energy thrown behind the concept of cars just driving everybody around, right? So when you think, the way to think about it is they've come up with the six levels of autonomy, where the level zero corresponds to no intelligence in the car at all to, uh, to level five where it says there is zero involvement from the driver and in between you have different ranges of how the driver will be involved and what you will be able to, uh, what, what the intelligence in the car will be able to do. So to put things into perspective, the latest and the greatest Tesla models, they are still at level two autonomy, right? So, so there's, there's long ways to go uh, in terms of reaching a car that is fully autopiloted by robots and sensors, and that involves a lot of things, right? It, cars have to distinguish between pedestrians, they have to be talking to each other, they have to be talking to infrastructure. So, so you, you see a lot of opportunity that will come out in vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications, for example, vehicle-to-infrastructure communications vehicle to device communication. So it's, it's a term that they, in, in the autonomous vehicle space, they say V2X. So your vehicle can talk to anything in the world. And that's, that's where the autonomy of the car will uh, start to show up in the next few years. So how is this applicable to our IoT startups or I, IoT players like Said and Faisal today? So how can this Industry 4.0 be an opportunity for these guys? Well, that's a good question, right? Because the opportunity is immense. It, it needs the right use cases to come forward, right? And I think uh, uh, DF Automation is doing the right thing there. They've, they've really identified the kind of use cases that autonomous robots will be used in warehouses, right? Now, now the idea is to kind of just, ha you have the wedge to penetrate the market and now you have to got to go out and expand and look for areas where it is so much more inefficient to use humans than it is to use robots, right? So think about it this way, that for every connection that the robot makes to another device, you're increasing the complexity of the entire system uh, exponentially, right? So if, if a robot goes out and connects to say 10 different uh, things on the shop floor or in the warehouse. You've got to maintain those connections. Uh, there will be like 45 of those connections that you have to maintain all the time. Continuously monitor them. Absolutely make sure that there is no downtime because if there is one connection that breaks, that means the robot is not fully uh, autonomous. Now a human cannot go out and maintain those connections. You need things like artificial intelligence and machine intelligence to come in and help these uh, robots make those decisions. So, so that, that's where I see a lot of applied learning will come in, lots of machine intelligence, uh, cluster intelligence coming in from uh, different sensors themselves that will direct the robots themselves on what to do without any human intervention. So I think those are use cases that will probably be helpful in both of their startups. Thank you. Um, like for Faisal, he did mention just now that he's uh, finding difficulty in terms of talent, right? Looking for the right skills, the right competency. With the IR 4.0, do we have r the right skill set and competency? Are we ready for this? <clears throat> well, uh, so I, I let me, let me by sh show of hands, how many students are here? Oh, quite a oh, number. Quite a, quite a few, right? So here, here's a, I, I don't have an answer to your question, but here's a way to think about it. When we talk about IoT, right? There is no IoT without two things. One is the internet, which is the software part of it. 
and the other is the T, which is the thing. Somebody's got to go out and build the things. So as you are taking your courses at the university, be, be mindful of the fact that you have to have both the hardware and the software work in tandem to, to make this uh, realization of the IoT world in the future. With, without either of them, there is, there is no uh, long-term scalability for the, uh, for the IoT network itself. So, th so I think that's important. From a talent perspective, uh, it will become better as people start to see more opportunity. There will be more vocational programs that will be coming in. People will be joining uh, universities just specifically to learn about sensor technologies and hardware and all of those. So I, I'm not concerned about that, but I think as, as students, uh, it, still in college, you should be paying attention to both to understanding both the hardware as well as the software component of it. So my next question is for our startup friends here. So how do you think this IR 4.0 will impact your business, if there's any? I have, uh, I have no idea what that is. Okay. <laughs> I, I first uh, stumbled upon the term IR 4.0 when um, a group of students I think from um, UTHM in Batu Pahat came to our office and have been asking me about IR 4.0 because they lecture, they are lecturers asked to. So <laughs> I can't answer it. I simply have no idea. But what I see that for every, um, especially for hardware startups, if for any, um, if if you want to grow, you always need to be focused. Um, IoT is a big thing. There's so many things that you can do in it. There's so many problems that you can solve, but focus on a simple problem that you think is solvable by you. Focus on that and then start to grow. Don't try to, st to jam in all kinds of features into your solutions. It's going to, as what Aman has said, um, the complexity is going to be exponential. Just focus on simple thing and after a while, once the market, um, once the product is in the market, only then you start to identify what are the other problems that you can solve. For us, our, the first foray into IoT is simply by a simple idea of tracking stolen cars. My friend's car got stolen in broad daylight in Bangsa, in front of MACD, during lunch hour, <laughs> taken by a tow truck. <laughs> so, and, and a week later, uh, my brother's car got stolen in Penang. So, I see that there is, uh, obviously, Malaysia is number six in the world when it comes to car theft. I only know about it then. So I see a big potential in solving this. And the moment we roll out our solution to the market, we notice that consumers, they don't have money. <laughs> they, they can't really pay that much for your solutions. And however, in our effort to, um, to sustain ourselves, we identify a new market, which is the fleet, the enterprises. They definitely need to track their vehicles to, and to understand which of these drivers behave recklessly on the road. So that's where, from the simple idea of tracking stolen cars, we use data to identify the behavior of drivers, and now we are growing in the insurance industry. So it's, it has to be step by step. You cannot just have a, you cannot, this is my motto, perfection is bullshit. Don't try to be perfect in your first attempt. If, if it's perfect, it means you have, you have done something wrong. Perfection takes time, perfection takes effort, perfection takes money. As a startup, you don't have that. So what you need to do is that identify a simple problem that you want to solve and the market is willing to pay for it. If the market is willing to pay for it, then go on. For the next feature, ask your customers, are you willing to pay for this? If they are willing to pay for it, then develop it. Don't develop a product without having a customer first. You need to identify who your customers are and only then you develop your product. I've seen a lot of IoT startups in Malaysia that failed simply because they are, the term is short sniri. <laughs> Meaning you, you have all the things, all the wonderful things, if we develop all these features, people will buy for it, we'll, we'll buy it. That's not the way to do a business. Lah. So yeah, that's it. Okay, that's a quick summary tip for all of you out there. Uh, if you want to learn more on uh, the challenges that Syed went through and any personal advice that 
that will help you develop your IoT solution and ideas. Speak to Syed. So Faisal, uh, in continuation to Syed's comment, um, how do you see that this IR 4.0 will impact your business, if any? And the number one fear I had <clears throat> in doing this border pass thing is taking away jobs from immigration officers. Um, you know, I don't know how you guys feel about them, but you know, I've been spending a whole lot of time at the airport past 18 months. And one of them was a pregnant lady, uh, three months pregnant, and she was doing the 2 a.m. shift. Uh, and it's hard work, uh, staying alert. Uh, I did the immigration officer training as well. That was fun. They teach you how to spot fake passports. So you really need to be uh, on the ball at it. And, you know, my fear was we'd build something, take away all their jobs, and I'd feel horrible about that. Uh, as a person, but uh, at the moment as it stands, there's just not enough immigration officers. So uh, whatever we are doing will be very helpful um, to them. And you know, we spoke to them, we mentioned that you know, we're worried about this and that. They said, don't worry right now, uh, we're totally stretched. Um, but th that's the recurring theme that uh, we read about and uh, hear about when it comes to uh, industry 4.0, a lot of people are worried about jobs. Now, um, maybe some of you might feel that computer programming is a way to go and we are doing all these uh, coding boot camps and we're putting them into uh, national curriculum for schools and things. But, you know, very quick question. Uh, were there more computer programmers in the US in 1990 uh, or less of them in 1990 compared to today? Do you think there are more computer programmers now or less? More? Who says more? More good hands? Less? Less. Yep, you're right. In 1990, there were 565,000 uh, computer programming jobs in the US. Today, it's almost half of that. And it's not just down to India, outsourcing to India. Even in India, a number of uh, computer programming jobs are going down as well. So, you know, usually people think that it's going to be the sort of manual jobs that are going to go away. Uh, but you're also seeing things in highly skilled jobs, accountants losing work to computers. JP Morgan has a computer that can do, uh, what, 30,000 hours of legal work in just, you know, three minutes. A lot of lawyers were upset about that. Um, and you know, you, you're going to see that going forwards. Um, companies are going to become more efficient. They can do a whole lot more with a whole lot less. I tell you, if I started this company back in 1990, I probably need a whole room of developers. But thanks to advancements in software, and uh, you know, the, the base is much higher. So uh, you can do a whole lot more with a whole lot less. And if you're still in school and you're doing computer programming, if you think and get by with three languages, uh, learn four or five. Um, you know, it, it's just a good idea. If you're a professional, you think and get away with just knowing Malaysian law, read up on Singaporean law, Indonesian law. Okay, so build up the competency level. Absolutely. Okay. I think that, that is uh, the best way to hedge against a robot or you know, one of Dr. Young's robots taking away your job later on. <laughs> Highly competitive market, huh? So Dr. Young, um, with your automation and robotics, uh, how would this 4.0 impact your business um, as a whole? Yeah, We always thought about that, that we are taking away people's jobs. As an engineer, we keep on thinking that we are not taking your job, we give you a better life and so on and so forth. <laughs> but anyhow, I mean, DF Automation went through the journey where we built robot. we are very happy about it, we are very proud of it a long time ago because it's a robot. But when we sell our robot to actually to Penang even, to Singapore and so on, all of a sudden they need a support. We basically need to fly there and do the job and my senior program can do that. So I can, my senior program can only do that at one time, so we can't really scale. So then we put into this IoT stuff in, in and, and we put in for the sake of not because we put in the IoT, we put in because we need that. We put in, all of a sudden we can just scale very fast. We sold to Mexico, we sold to Philippines. And then outside, they go issue immediately one hour, we can really troubleshoot and, and move things faster. 
so as a as a DF point of view right now, when we see that potential, a lot of other customers come here. I mean, if you see, I'm not sure if you went to Deep House shopping mall, there's a sh sushi robot moving around. That is actually our robot with a partner. So when there is an issue, actually we don't come here. We're actually troubleshooting in Johor Bahru. So that's what technology come around. And my team only 20 plus odd people. I only have four R&D guys. The rest of them, we are operations, sales and marketing. I'm the one that um, not doing so much thing. I just come here and give talk and so on. <laughs> But on, on the other side, I'm also a lecturer in UTM. I think very interesting topic early on was the talent and how far it can grow. Like this year, most of all the subject has to include IoT. I'm teaching embedded system this semester. And uh, embedded system, basically, they need to learn how to program, how to do stuff. And the first assignment is very simple, 10 mark. First thing first, they need to do the embedded system. The last two mark, you need to connect to internet. That's it. Once you get that, you get 10 mark. The second assignment is it's a real project. So last year, I got some student that managed to do IoT stuff to predict certain things, and they, they, they open a startup and move on. So I think from the university point of view, a lot of uh, academia are actually towards that direction, prepare for a very interesting journey in the future. Uh, but back again, don't do IoT for the sake of IoT. Try to understand the real need. Ask your customer why they want. I got one student come to me saying that, you know, I got this product. How can I put IoT inside? I was like, What's, what's, who's your customer? Are they willing to pay? And so and so forth. Yeah. If I could jump Thank in you. over there, don't uh, make the mistake of getting some really cool technology and then figuring out, okay, who can I sell this to or who can I market it to? I think that, that is where a lot of companies will struggle. You've always got to start with the customer experience first and then work and figure out, okay, what are the right technologies to put into this to make that happen? If you do it the other way around, uh, you're not really gonna get very far with it. You're gonna build a, a solution looking for a problem. Yeah. So, Aman, have you got something to add on to that? Well, I think in terms of jobs, uh, it's a very evolutionary process, right? So if you go back to Industrial Revolution One people in London really had jobs lighting street lights every evening, right? And when electricity came along, they said, oh, these people are going to be out of jobs. But guess what? Those guys adapted. They found other jobs which are much cleaner, much healthier, and were a better utilization of their time. The same thing is going to happen with uh, autonomy, right? Uh, when, you're, when robots are solving complexity in connections, Humans are going to be analyzing a lot of data, looking at the use cases for the data, because ultimately, if technology is not being used by humans, it's not going to be successful in the marketplace. Humans have to be comfortable to that technology, and only those ideas will win. So there will be uh, instances where, yes, there will be job losses, but then I think over a period of time, they will, people will have to shift to newer and much more available resources and retrain themselves, as Faisal said, to adapt to the changing markets. Thank you. So, um, any advice to our startups out there who is interested to venture in the IoT space? Faisal and Said, you did mention a few. Um, Dr. Yong? A lot. I, as a lecturer, I have a list of a wish list <laughs> from a lot of the industry. But I mean, just last week I gave a talk at TED Talk somewhere, university, and I was asked to give a talk on how to, how to switch on a smart home with voice. I was like, I'm in smart manufacturing, why I was given this title? But it just happened that because I called written a paper with my professor in China about this topic. So then I said, okay, why don't I use this two weeks time to prepare the content? And how easy is it to make my house a smart home? So the easiest way is actually to find a smart light. You can switch on the light by just say, turn on light, turn off light, so on and so forth. So then I go for Google. I try to look for Lazada and so to, like, to look for who, where can I buy. I couldn't get any. Then I bought from Lazada. It took me six weeks to arrive. So I said, no problem. I just buy and see whether it can arrive or not. They said, I need that devices for my live show during the TED Talk uh, last week. Said I, I went out to the shop. I went to five store. One of the biggest light shop looked at me and said, what's this? I have not seen this before. 
And then I say that, oh, this is a wireless lab. Oh, really? Then he laughed and then they said, oh, they are not selling. I went to another shop, said the same thing. They said, oh, we are not that far yet. We are still a bit old generation. Then I went to the third store. Basically, there are five workers are running around looking at a lot of a different types of light. I showed them, I said, I want this light. Then he looked at me. All of a sudden, all the workers freeze. Come and see. I have not seen this light before. I was like, where are we now? <laughs> Then finally, I got need two weeks only. Then I really need the light to do the show. It's a Philips from Philips Hue actually. Hue, yeah. It's not cheap. So, so I called up my sibling in Singapore. I said, hey, help me to look for this light. I couldn't find anything in the online. Everything has to be like three weeks, four weeks, six weeks term. All of a sudden, my sister said, hey, I got one. Come. So I drove my car two hours, three stay, take the light with a dust. Seemed like nobody bought it. <laughs> then I came back. Then I tried it out. So, so what I'm trying to tell you is... Uh, it seems like there's a great opportunity there and, uh, and uh, a lot of people still not aware of this uh, smart light. But that light is about 300 ringgit compared to a normal 20 ringgit. As a starter kit, I need to buy three light. And when I try it out, I'm amazed. My kid loves it. You can just say that turn the living room to sunset, it becomes sunset. You just say turn the room, become pinkish. My, I have a daughter, then it becomes pink. And they love it very much. Yeah, I, I enjoy it very much. All of a sudden, actually, it's more than that. You can actually use the IFTT, I'm not sure you know that, Tasker. You drive your car, you can put a Google location. Just before you arrive the car, you switch on the light. Then they even know that your car, let's say, is a bit intelligent, know how many people inside the room. You go in, they will switch on the TV for you. Then you can even know who's, let's say you have a kid, you will switch on the small little, maybe Peppa Pig, children's movie, and so on. So that's, that's technology. From standpoint of view, during that time for the two weeks, I tried to get a consultant, I tried to get people to advise me on how to do a smartphone and apparently it's not there yet. So I, then I keep on thinking, I want to create another startup, my sex startup or smart home. So let's see who's faster. <laughs> Sorry, and Faisal, do you have uh, anything to add on in terms of advising our startups out there who's interested to venture in the IoT space? Uh, don't. <laughs> Give some words of encouragement. I mean, uh, don't do it unless you really care about the problem you're trying to solve. Uh, because if you are doing it just because it's trendy, it's a buzzword, uh, you know, in five years' time, maybe people won't even be saying IoT anymore. So, you know, unless you really care about what you're working on, and IoT is the right tool to get to achieve what you want to achieve, then go for it. But Otherwise, focus on something that you really, really care about. Said? I simply echo Faisal. Don't, unless you are really into it. Because um, the thing with IoT, it's, it, it's hard work. It's hardware, it's hard work. It involves a lot of capital burn. You're going to waste a lot of money testing and testing so many iterations. Only do it when you have a real problem to be solved. If you're just um, having fun, you are just trying to add all the features before getting a customer first, mm. you're going to waste your money. Mm. Uh, so that's it. Thank you. So I've got a question here from Benjamin Heen. Is that right? With IoT, it is, much, it is much easier to collect consumer data that are more personal, such as location, lifestyle patterns, and so on. Though it is a case that we can claim it may help us to improve our lives, but what would the boundary between that and being invasive in the user's life? So it talks about um, sharing data uh, platform here and how, how is it intruding a user or a consumer? If, if I may answer, um, I think 10 years ago, if you will, we were to tell our friends that, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to go, I'm going to go into a website, I'm going to upload my food photo, I'm going to upload my status for today. I'm going to tell everyone that I'm getting married to somebody else. I'm going to upload whatever I have been doing while I'm on holiday. I'm going or to... jump into a stranger's car. Yeah. Yeah. Or stays at um, 
a stranger's house, um, like Airbnb and so on, yeah, people will say you are nuts. But after a while, you get used to it. However, there is a boundary. And um, previously, we were shocked that, uh, not really were shocked, uh, but as advertising on the internet grows, um, you, your browsing behavior start to get tracked. Um, after all, people start to get familiar with it again. And um, I think the... <laughs> it's a very difficult yeah. discussion. Actually. I think yeah. for car, you have the security, the regulatory. Yeah. For, for what we are doing, um, it's always that regulatory body that, that um, controls what kind of data that you transfer, uh, how deep the data is, and what you use the data for. Uh, for Malaysia especially, we are thankful that Bank Negara Malaysia is really protective of consumers. I, I, I kid you not that they are really protective of your data. You should be thankful of it. Um, but after a while, it's... Uh, for companies, you, you have to be careful because at the end, the way we position ourselves is we are the one that protects the consumer data against the other... Um, um, we are the one that collects the data on behalf of the, cons on the consumers and the consumer decides where the data should be given to. So at the end of the day... Um, so you are the custodian the, of the data? Yeah, the user should be given the empowerment to own the data. Yeah. Aman, would you like to add? Yes, I think this is a philosophical question, right? I think uh, when I look at millennials, this the millennial generation absolutely has no problems sharing their data. They have no uh, qualms about where their data lives and how it, it's, it's interacting with other systems. And I think unless there is a change in the underlying business models on how businesses are reaching out to millennials and whether they care about their data privacy or not, I think it's not going to go away. Uh, people have a reasonable right to expect privacy, but I think since the data is also spread over so many different disparate systems, and not every system will be talking to each other, there is that custodian element already being taken care of. So some data will maybe remain with Katsuna, some data will remain with uh, DR Robotics. As long as they're not talking, people will be okay with that, and there's no reason to uh, believe that all of that data will be compromised. So I think the underlying business models, when they start changing and the tide turns over, uh, those are the things that will enable it. Un but until that point, uh, the consumers don't care. And uh, of course, the industry will never care about privacy issues. Thank you. So I've got no more questions from, oh. Uh, for motorcycles. We, for motorcycles. We actually, we have a couple of hundred motorcycles in Indonesia right now running with Katsana. Uh, it's just that the money is not there. The money is not there. Did yes. you say Indonesia? Yes. Okay. Um, um, simply because uh, for motorcycles, the value of bikes is that much compared to the service that we offered. The, it's priced quite a premium compared to the typical solutions. So it doesn't make sense for a bike to be equipped with our solutions unless yeah, <laughs> depends. Yeah. Superbike. Uh, unless if that's why I from early on we focus bike. mostly on enterprises, because for enterprise there is a strong uh, reason for them to equip their vehicles with our solution. They are willing to pay for it. We have a valid problem that the customer is willing to pay for our solution. So that's why um, ninety-five percent of our current customers are all enterprises. Only five percent commercial. Uh, only five percent consumers, because that's what we learn. Um, for what we are doing, money comes from the enterprises. Any more questions from the floor? Yeah, I'm coming. I think he said he need a speaker. <laughs> By the way, this is a microphone. I'm going to pass it to you here. <laughs> Just to let you know. Uh, hi, uh, actually I have uh, some kind of uh, 
a question about uh, if there is uh, some kind of the hardware design uh, for a new product. And I would like to know about your opinions, how we can we fight with uh, big companies? Because uh, maybe of uh, some other overseas companies, they have a better quality than uh, as a Malaysia com company. And the second question will be, how can we avoid your hardware design being copycatted? Thank you. Could you please repeat the second question? Oh, the first, okay. The, Can you please repeat both second. questions? Okay, uh, the first question will be, uh, if we met up uh, some kind, because uh, as a new startup, and we met up some kind of the new hardware design, new product, how do we fight with uh, big companies? Maybe uh, they have uh, same product or what? And my second question will be, if you make up this kind of the hardware design, new product, how do you avoid being copycatted? Copycat, you know. Yeah, maybe I answer this. So for the first one, I think when you fight, no, I wouldn't say fight, I think you need to position yourself. Where are you compared to the branded one? I mean, for AGV, actually, it's a 100 years technology. A lot of people say that, you know why you make AGV? It's been there for 100 years. Then I say that, I don't know, customer come to us and say they want it. In fact, the customer comes over and say, we don't want to do it. I say, why don't you just buy from Japan, German? Then the customer say, no, no, Yon, just please make one and see how it goes. Then we are very reluctant. Then we say, okay, we build one. We build one, then we charge them quite a lot of money. Like, I think 40,000, I think. And we sold to them. We were so worried to price that price, 40,000 ringgit Malaysia. Once they buy, you know what they say? So cheap, ah? Can I order another four more units? Then the other four, four units. Then we were like, hey, what happened? Then we go drill down the customer with us. It's become very friend already. Then they say, they want to get one unit from the US. It's about $1.5 million. <laughs> that was Kiva. That was five years back. Then we were, okay. Then they say, Japan? Japan, the robot is about the same price. I would say, maybe slightly more expensive. But for our solution is, before they deploy the robot, they need, we need to go and see. So if from Japanese, they need to send people from Japan to come. Five-star hotel, five nights, that is all cost. So you need to position yourself where you are. So for us, it's affordable, but with a feature. Along the way, we are growing. Then we get a consultant coming saying that, hey, Young, I help you to improve the robot. You know what they say? Young, your robot looks like a moving toolbox. You need to make it nicer so that you can compete with the big guy. We trust them. We pay their money. We want to make a Ferrari. After a couple of months, Ferrari came out, so did the customer. You know what, what customer said? We don't want the Ferrari, we want the old one. <laughs> so that's what really happened. About the copyright thing, I think in Malaysia it's a very interesting place. Uh, we built, to be frank, because I have a lot of students come to me and say that, yo, I got a brilliant idea, can you sign an NDA? I was like, I'm sorry, I can't sign the NDA. Is that number one? Number two is the same thing. Yo, I got a, I got a very good idea, but I worry people copy me. I said, brilliant, so what's your next step? Yeah, I'm going to ask again how to do that. So after two years, I met this student again. I said, what happened to your uh, project? I said, I'm still looking how to protect my idea. Two years, nothing happened. <laughs> so as a lecturer point of view, I would say that just do it and see how it goes. Because to be frank, you don't have the money to file all the pattern and all the stuff and so on. So for DF Automation, we file three patterns now. I got budget to file five patterns. My guy cannot file. I got another company, Mr. Tech Innovation. This guy, my, one of my guys here. I have no budget for file the pattern. He keep on asking me, Young, can I file the pattern? Don't tell everyone that. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we Sharing secrets now, huh? So back again, I think it really depends on your situation and condition. If you have a big market potential, I think the pattern stuff, you need to put one side first. Along the way, when you have a budget, then you file the pattern and then you get the support, etc. <laughs> Any more questions from the floor? You need to exercise a little bit. Thank you. <laughs> Who was it? How's it going, guys? My name's Austin. Um, so circling back to kind of the morality behind automation, um, what do you guys think the solution is going to be for all the job loss due to automation? Do you think it's going to be, I think Switzerland is experimenting with like a universal income, or where do you think all these, you know, these jobless people are gonna go after this? 
Very difficult question. <laughs> Would you want him to repeat it again? I'm, I'm good. Um, so there's a lot of uh, talk about universal salary and etc. And to be frank, we have no idea how the industrial 4.0 is going to affect. This is going to be in the next 5 to 10 years' time. But as now for the standpoint of DF automation, what we always say is that we although replace people, for example, to push a trolley, the operator needs to walk 3 kilometers and carry up to 500 kg. And in some cases, it's a pregnant woman to push. And back home, they are actually everywhere they are pain. So it's actually kind of, we are trying to help them in, in, in some sense. And some of the working scenario is actually in a chemical environment. So it's against safety and so on and so forth. But at one point, they might lose job as well. So we always say is that they need to adapt just like what Aman said earlier on. So rather than go for the operator job, they will look into a high level uh, kind of a job, maybe an R&D guy or maybe work in the R&D company that build the robot. So the value chain value actually change from the manufacturing all the way into R&D and so on. So I can only answer this for the universal salary. I think it's a bit too far for me to answer that. Thank you. Any more questions from the floor? Yes? No? Okay, so thank you. Hope you enjoyed our session. So hope you guys enjoyed the rest of our Magic Symposium program. Thank you. All right, thank you, Diana. Thank you so much, uh, Amanjot, uh, Dr. Yong, uh, Inja Faisal, Shahid, and also Anisha uh, once again. There you have it, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the, uh, fire, uh, the fireside chat on opportunity and challenges for startups in IoT. And thank you so much for the questions earlier on. And of course, uh, one of the questions was on the patent. Uh, don't patent anything, because uh, even if you do, China always brings out another one. So no matter what it is. Generic medicines, you name it, everything, they can do it, even though you patent it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, looks like uh, we are going to go for the workshop and the talks. And, uh, of course, uh, I would like to urge you once again to fill up the uh, short survey that we have via the app, event uh, mobile app, which is known as Bizabo. And uh, after each session of auditoriums as well as the workshop and talks, you stand to win some cool prizes like the T-shirts, the, uh, the PlayStations, the iPad Shuffle, the iPod Shuffle, the Starbucks credits, uh, we have the Zalora shopping voucher, and the Touch and Go, etc. And there's plenty more to go. So uh, in order to do that, you have to actually fill up five surveys uh, in the Bizabo app. And uh, good luck to you. And of course, we have uh, prizes every single day from today onwards until this coming Saturday. The gift redemption counter opens at 4.30. Uh, there are a range of amazing prizes I mentioned. And the first 150 participants who answer two surveys entitled to vouchers worth 120 ringgit. Those who answer four surveys entitled to uh, the MA 2017 uh, t-shirt. And the first 150 participants who answer five surveys are entitled to the lucky draw, which consists of the items which I just mentioned. Okay, now it's time for the master classes and talks. The sessions are held at the GAP Space Malaysia Room, uh, Indonesia Room, located on the second floor, and the Maker's Lab on the first floor, just beside Chillax Cafe. Just for your information, we are actually at the first floor, and on top is actually the second floor. And the next session at Maker's Lab will be actually held right here at the auditorium. Just to let you know, because we did have some technical issues with the Maker's Lab. So uh, make sure to be here if you're going to be attending the Maker's Lab uh, area later on. So the next session at the Maker's Lab will be right here for Blue Ocean Shift Beyond Competing Proven Steps to Inspire Confidence and uh, Seize New Growth by Raj Kumar, the CEO of UCSI Consulting Group. And the session at the Gap Space will be on Counterintuitive Strategies to Growth by Scott Halcom, Director of E-Commerce, Babylist. And the Masterclass at the Indonesian Room will be on a Lawyer Up by Faris Shah, founder and partner of Faris Shah and Partner. And the session at the Malaysian Room will be on 10 Practical Ways to Get Started with 
Google Analytics by Aliza Sean, co-founder and chief executive officer of Sparkline. And at 5.30, right here in the auditorium, because it's supposed to be at Maker's Lab, but since we have a technical problem there, it'll be at the auditorium right here. It'll be on Building Teams at Scale by Larry Gordon, principal software engineer and front-end architecture, Westfield Retail Solutions. And also the mentoring session is held at CWS at 5.30. So it looks like for all those who are actually headed to uh, the other room, the Maker's Lab, uh, those sessions will be held right here in the auditorium. And of course, tomorrow, we will see you at 9.25 a.m. for the fireside chat on finding market opportunities for innovation and growth by Brond Palare, CEO of Pixel Play. So, see you guys later. Baby, this is what you